Hey all of you sheepies, today is December 2nd, 2020. That means we are in Luke's Gospel, chapter 2. Did you do your homework? Well, chapter 2 of Luke is probably the one that we are most familiar with. It is the, the Christmas Eve passage, the birth of Jesus. So, Chapter 2 opens with politics. Did you notice that? Caesar Augustus is the Roman emperor, and he's issued a decree for a census to be taken. Quirinius, that's a fun word to say, isn't it? Quirinius is governor of Syria. Now, I did just a little bit of homework on this part of the text, and you know, some scholars debate the accuracy of the date of this census because it doesn't quite line up with the death date of Herod the Great. Jesus is born when Herod the Great is ruler. And so that, that uh, date of the census is after the death of Herod the Great. So some scholars have debated this, and one way to kind of correlate this or, or make it line up, it might have been that Quirinius may have governed for a short period of time that was not recorded. Anyway, chapter two opens with politics. Isn't that interesting for the political climate in which we are in? It's all about taxes, taxes for Caesar. Bethlehem, they have to go to Bethlehem because it is Joseph's hometown. So why is it important that Jesus is to be born in Bethlehem? Well, a couple, couple reasons. We have to turn back to our Old Testament to Micah. Micah, the prophet Micah, he's one of our, our minor prophets. The, the book of Micah isn't very long. I think we probably looked at Micah last year. Micah is all about the lowly, lifting up the lowly. But something else, the prophet Micah foretells, prophesies that a promised ruler is going to come from Bethlehem. So you can look that up. Go back to Micah and uh, look that up. Micah is all about the little guy. Another thing maybe you knew or did not know, Bethlehem means house of bread. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Bethlehem, house of bread. Isn't that cool? Shepherds, and angels. I have to say, the shepherds, that part is my favorite part. So I was thinking about this almost all day, really. The shepherds, well, they went to see Jesus in their chore clothes. They had more than mud on their boots, well, on their sandals. They had banner as a uh, our grandson, or Nur, as grandson Dax says, they had some sheep banner uh, on their, their clothes, probably. And it says that they lived. There were shepherds living out in the fields. They were they're nomadic. They did not have a home. So they lived right with the sheep out in, in the wild. Sheep herders. Pastor Ryan from Scandia Free uh, here in Ballaton, when we pastors get together, I, I love how, I love Pastor Ryan's heart for people, the people of God, but I love how he refers to himself and then he just adds us pastors in too as she, uh, sheepdogs, sheepdogs for the shepherd. I, I love that. And so as you think about the shepherds, sheep herders, Sheep herders in chore clothes is what I, I put in my notes to share with all of you. They get this message from the angels to do not be afraid. I think this is probably the second time 
in Luke, we hear those three little words, do not be afraid. Because you think, I think they were probably more afraid of the angel than they probably would be if a mountain lion snuck up on their sheep. Don't you think? And so this angel appears, do not be afraid. And then all of a sudden, there's this big praise band. And they're singing, glory, glory, glory. And then they say, hashtag, I bring you good news. And so they get out their iPhones and they say, hashtag, good news. <laughs> no, not really. But this is the first time we hear that phrase. I bring you good news. Do you know what the word gospel means? Good news. This good news of Jesus foretold. So we have singing angels on Pandora. Think about Denise, so she, she's out walking. She, she texts me a song, I'm, I'm listening to Pandora. And here, here's an awesome praise song. This is our, our, our first angel singing on, on Pandora. Then one of my most fav favorite lines of, of this segment of the, the shepherds and the angels, they say, come, let's go and see this thing that has happened this this thing so can you imagine when they get there how wild they are and really how wild mary and joseph probably are to see them the shepherds go to church and they're in their chore clothes i love that part don't you then it says mary treasured these things in her heart that this is um, Christmas Eve now. She's treasuring these things in her heart. And the wise men have not gotten there yet. If you'll notice in our nativity, they're not here yet. The wise men come on Epiphany, and so she doesn't even have the gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh yet. She, she's just so, soaking it all in, all of this wow factor. Mary treasured these things in her heart. Then we skip ahead. Jesus is now eight days old, and by custom, he needs to be circumcised, as per the Jewish law. And he's also named officially. He's named Jesus, and that he's presented in the temple. And an offering was supposed to be given of either two doves or two pigeons, probably two pigeons, because Mary and Joseph were pretty poor, and so they were cheaper than, than the doves. So while they are there at the temple for this, the presenting Jesus as the firstborn son to be dedicated to God, all of a sudden there is this old man named Simeon. And he's been waiting for the Messiah to come. He's an old man. All of a sudden he shuffles along and he goes over to Mary and Joseph and he scoops up the baby. Mamas, you know how protective we can be of our newborns, right? Jesus is only eight days old here. And all of a sudden this strange man in the church house scoops up your baby and holds him in his arms. So he starts prophesying. He, he starts prophesying over Jesus. And then he, he says, for my eyes have seen your salvation. Remember I said last night that Luke is going to be about salvation, about soteriology. Remember that word? Soteriology just means salvation. My eyes have seen your salvation. In other words, he knows that he is holding the Messiah in his arms. He can die now. He can die in peace. This week is all about peace as we light the second candle in our Advent wreath. And then he says something else. He looks at Mary and he says, this, this baby, this child will grow up to be for many, you know, lead, lead many. But then he says to Mary, and a sword will pierce your very soul. 
So just eight days ago, at the birth of her son, she's pondering all of these things in her heart. She's treasuring all of these things in her heart. And then now in the church, this, this old man says, and a sword will pierce your very soul. I often wonder, as Mary is standing at the foot of the cross, and I'll remind us again when we get there, did she remember this day? Did she remember this day and the words from this old man, Simeon, as she stood at the foot of the cross? I'm sure she did. I'm sure she did. Then we also have somebody else in the temple that day. Anna is a prophetess. We have prophet, males. Prophetess is a female. Girls can prophesy too. And so we have Anna who speaks about the redemption of Jerusalem. The Messiah is to come to bring restoration, first to the Jews and then to the Gentiles. So we have Simeon and Anna. That's one of my favorite stories. So I, I hope that you enjoyed that part. Then we have, we skip ahead. They, they, they go home and we see that Jesus is growing. He's a toddler, he's growing and the next paragraph, all of a sudden he is 12 years old. We don't get a lot about Jesus's childhood in, in biblical text. So here he's 12 years old and Mary and Joseph and I, their, their family, I, I'm sure all good Jews went to the temple in Jerusalem for Passover once a year. Um, I think we'll probably get three Passovers that we see in Luke's gospel, if I remember right. The, the Passover before Jesus is crucified, of course, that is one that we know, but um, there's another one too. I can't think of it offhand, but uh, we'll see it when we get there, okay? So here is Passover as custom. They go to Jerusalem, they make the trek. And as Passover is ending, the, the group is walking home to Nazareth and they get down the road and no Jesus. Mary and Joseph are thinking, oh, he's behind us with one of the other relatives or one of the other family friends. No Jesus. Can you imagine they're, they're, they're freaking out? Parents, we've all probably been there. All, all of a sudden, our, if we're shopping or something and we turn our back for a minute and yikes, where, where's our kid, you, you know? And it's not a good feeling. So they, get, they go back to Jerusalem. I'm not sure how, how far down the road they are, but they get back to Jerusalem and they, they're searching everywhere, everywhere that a 12-year-old boy could be, except for the temple. They finally go to the temple and there he is. He's sitting in the midst of these old men, not just old men, I guess these grown-ups, and he's teaching. And it's like, Jesus, where have you been? Yeah, I, I would like to have been a mouse in the corner, wouldn't you? You, you know, as parents, we, we know where in the world have you been? Your mother and I were looking all over for you kind of thing. And Jesus just matter-of-factly says, why were you searching for me? Didn't you know that I would be in my father's house? Uh, can you imagine Joseph? Ugh. I'm your father. Was it the first time that they totally identified, you know, who Jesus was? Who Jesus' father was? Can you imagine the conversation Mary must have had with Joseph when Jesus was out of earshot on the way home? I, th I was thinking about that. But then, you know, it, it tells us, it tells us that again, and I missed this. I think I missed it last year too. It was good to reread it. Mary treasured these things in her heart. We get that twice here in chapter 2. Did she recall that event, too, as she's standing at the foot of the cross when they lost Jesus, and there he is in the temple teaching? 
And then it tells us, and Jesus was, they went home, and Jesus was obedient to them. And he grew in wisdom and stature and favor with God and men. And so it just tells us that he's growing in life and faith after all of this. And that pretty much wraps up chapter two. So again, what was your favorite part of Luke chapter two? What questions do you have? What are you struggling with? What, what wowed you in amazement? And uh, tomorrow we dive into Luke chapter three, which is all about John the Baptist. And then we get some genealogy of Jesus. And, and that's chapter three. Chapter three is preparing for Jesus's public ministry. Chapter four uh, will be a kind of a wow again. And so next week, it's all about John. Have a good night. I just wrapped up a jam video here. Uh, Vicar Rick was at his house doing a recording, and I'm down at church. And boy, this technology stuff is um, challenging and a blessing all in one, and one thing here. So I hope that you are enjoying the videos, and I hope that you are enjoying Luke, and I hope that you are learning and, and growing in your faith too, because I continue to learn and grow as I read and as I study, and I love that. You can never have too much Jesus. Sleep well. Jesus loves you. So do I. We'll see you tomorrow.